Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Hinderleiter. Welcome to uh, this ongoing executive leadership series. Uh, we're calling it uh, Leader, Leading Through Crisis, uh, which we're in the midst of uh, with the likes we've never seen before. So really, our intention uh, was to just, just get online and have conversations uh, with people that, uh, that are going through all this stuff like we are and uh, hopefully some of the things that we're sharing will be beneficial. Uh, so that's, that's really our intent, our purpose is to provide an online venue for business leaders uh, to discuss the most pressing topics. And we got some pressing topics with uh, the economy, uh, with COVID-19, uh, all of those things, it's, it's kind of the perfect storm. So today's topic is change and, and we're drinking from the fire hose of change, so it's it's a topic that's really worth talking about. Uh, sometimes, in my experience, that we drive change uh, intentionally because we know strategically that's what we need to do. And there are times when change is just thrust upon us, and that's that's kind of the world that we're in right now. So, kind of just uh, the discussion approach is uh, we're just going to have an open discussion, um, uh, and at the end of the presentation, we'll answer questions which you can just do uh, by unmuting, uh, or the other way is you can just uh, put a question in the, in the chat and then we'll deal with those at the end. So uh, my, uh, my partner is uh, Mark Johnson. Mark is the president of Xtree, and Mark's an executive uh, tech guy. He's an advisor to, uh, to companies. But before uh, Xtree, uh, Mark was a senior VP and a chief information officer for several global companies to include great big ones, uh, you know, billion dollar Fortune 500 companies with 100,000 or more employees on one end of the spectrum to rapid growth, uh, fast paced startups and small businesses. So that's one of the things I think is cool about Mark's experience. It's the range is really wide. His experience is really deep. Um, so anyway, uh, Mark, uh, welcome, and uh, the show is all yours, buddy. Talk us through change. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that nice introduction. So let's talk about change. Uh, three key points we'll cover today is leading through change. How do you establish the right mindset during times of change? And then what are the key actions that leaders should be taking during these times of change? So there's a lot of different causes uh, for change. Uh, obviously we're seeing right now what a crisis can do to cause change and there's many forms of crisis and how they can impact change in your organization. But there's also other uh, variables can impact change. So you can have changes to uh, the, the, what the customer needs or new approaches to providing the market with uh, that particular service or product. We've seen that in many industries. So looking way back, we probably all remember the days of Kodak and Kodak film and Kodak was the standard. Somebody was to take a picture, you probably took it on Kodak film. Uh, but along came digital providers of, of cameras uh, and Kodak was really slow to respond to that and, and you don't see Kodak in that space anymore. You could also look at many other examples such as retail industry and what online approaches have done to the traditional brick and mortar approach. And there's many others that we can go through. So anytime there's a change and the user or, or customer needs, or there's a new approach to providing that, there's gonna be a big change in the market. Also, it can be just caused by new competitors in your market. So competitors that weren't traditionally in your market move into that space and cause a change and disruption as well. You know, we're seeing that today in the grocery business. Who would have ever thought that the grocery business would be impacted by uh, these new companies that are now moving into that space? Uh, I heard an interesting quote a few months ago from the president of HEB, which is a large regional grocer in, in the Texas market. And uh, he was talking about how the race for his company is for HEB to become a digital company before these new digital companies like Amazon become a grocery company. And so they're in a race with new competitors they've never seen before. And that can happen really in any, any industry. So this is something that should be on every uh, company's uh, view. So one thing we know for sure is 
the future is change. Uh, I think one of the things we've seen change over the years is the pace. It's changing faster than we've ever seen before. So taking a step back and looking at different perspectives on change, it's interesting when you want to take a vacation, people often say, I need a change. And change now is viewed in a, in a very positive, good perspective. Vacations, ah, oh, great, a change. But in a workplace, for some reason, it's often reviewed very negatively. So if you go into somebody and say, I want to change your job, or change your role or what you're doing every day, that's usually very negative and you get some resistance to that. So why is that? Why is there such a different viewpoint on change in those two uh, perspectives? Well, you know, change is scary for a lot of different reasons, but here's three very common reasons. And as a leader, our goal is to change these three areas and take the un out of those three elements. So uh, as a leader, help people see change coming, help them to expect that it's coming, help them to feel like it's gonna be a good thing and understand it and help them feel like they're prepared for it and the organization is prepared for it and it's gonna be a positive outcome. So it's reshaping their view of change. And then there's always gonna be those few that just have a resistance to change in general. And so you have to help them change their willingness to change and, and help them sort through that as a leader and create an environment that embraces change uh, as a whole. Here's a, a great cartoon. I think we probably all as leaders have experienced this. Uh, you, you ask the, the, the team who wants change and everybody's all for it. Uh, but then you say, well, which one of you wants to change? It's a little bit different reaction. And then when you ask them who wants to lead the change, it, everybody just kind of disappears. So. Uh, it, it's a cartoon, but unfortunately, it, it's reality often in some organizations. So as a leader, what do you, what do, you do? <clears throat> so one key point is in change, you have to lead. You can't follow, especially during rapid change. If you're playing a game of, of catch up, you're probably in a losing game. So the, the key is to be in a leading position. The other key is to find ways to differentiate your business. In a conversation a couple of weeks ago, uh, Dr. Hindelider talked about, you know, making your business essential. And that's, you know, we've heard about recently during this COVID crisis about essential businesses versus non-essential. But think about what can you do to make your services or whatever your, your company provides more essential, where it's not optional for companies that is something that they have to have, or at least make it unique in a way that differentiates it from the competitors. The other thing is to look at your organization. While this is uh, an org chart uh, with a little bit of humor added to it, uh, probably if you took a look at your org chart, there are some negative people that, that are kind of the killers of great ideas or that kind of pa that are pushing back on innovation and change. So yeah, I think you have to kind of look through the organization and say, do I have people that will help me lead this change and, and be well positioned uh, for the future of the organization? Do I have those people in the right positions? And if not, then you have to look at what are your options? Do you bring in third parties that help be that change catalyst or perform that role as a change catalyst or mentor people to help them better cope with change? But it's something as a, as a leader, you have to take a hard look at these roles and say, you know, who do we have the right people in the right roles for what lies ahead? So what are the actions that should be, should be taken now? One, obviously, is creating that, that right mindset. Change is a time of opportunity. Change it from being a, a negative mindset to being a very positive outlook for the company and for individuals. And then make sure you have the right leaders in the right roles. You know, while during these times, we all have to make hard decisions, and sometimes those decisions uh, require us to make cuts and to reduce expenses. You can't do that forever, though. I've seen a lot of companies destroyed where they, they continue that mindset forever. And there's the old saying is, you don't shrink to greatness. So you have to think about how do you grow during times of change and how do you make bold, decisive actions during these times of changes to really make it an opportunity for the organization. And then look at the different solutions that are out there. Is it bringing in different catalysts to drive change and create new opportunities for business? You know, digital transformation is something that should be on every business's radar right now. And, and 
it's, it's a topic that's often misunderstood. Uh, digital transformation is not about just spending a lot of money on technology. That's not what it's about. It's about transitioning the organization to be a more digital organization, more agile, and to leverage what technology can help you uh, do for your company. You know, here's a great cartoon. Uh, uh, on the left, you have uh, the leader saying, ah, we don't need to worry about digital transformation. It's probably years away. And, and this crisis really has, has, has tested those organizations that had that mindset. So I can tell you across the board, companies that were very digital already have fared very well during this crisis. They, they already had processes in place they were very digital that could be ran from wherever they were in the world, from remote or from home. And those that weren't prepared have really struggled to quickly revamp their organization to be able to handle uh, this new dynamic. So, you know, the crisis is really driving this to the forefront right now. But even after COVID passes, digital transformation is real and it's going to really differentiate the winners and the people that lag behind and struggle uh, going forward. So you, you need to have a solid digital transformation plan, uh, how you not only come through this crisis, but how you position your company for all those changes we talked about earlier. You know, as, as a reminder, you know, a crisis actually is a, is a opportunity. You know, here's several companies that were founded back in the time of the last crisis in 2008 and have thrived. Many of them are multi-million dollar, billion dollar companies now. And you don't have to be a startup. There's, if you look back in 2008, the last crisis, there are companies that actually gained a lot of market share during that time period. Their competitors struggled and allowed them to really gain market share. So the question is, you know, what are you doing to best position your company during this time of change? to come out stronger on the other side. And I'll close with just this closing thought. And you know, we've seen this before, but it really is holds true during times of change. And it's the best way to predict your future is to create it. So be that bold leader that helps step your organization up to the forefront of change and, and help them create their new future. If you'd like to do a deeper dive on this topic, um, Dr. Hinderleiter and I would be glad to, to, to talk with you and uh, we'll also be glad to provide you a copy of this material after this uh, presentation and you'd be, feel free to share it uh, with your teams. Mark, I'll open it back up. Yeah, hey, you know, Mark, I was looking at a, a screen. If you wouldn't mind going back a couple, uh, slide 16, yeah. uh, where you kind of uh, really uh, highlighted companies that uh, actually thrived or surged during that 08 recession. <clears throat> As I look at those, uh, those look like companies that have very strong uh, digital uh, presence. Uh, you know, Uber, yeah. you, you, you just have a phone on your app to get a driver, right? <laughs> kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, Pinterest is, a, is an online Instagram, Slack. Uh, uh, Dropbox, uh, Groupon, all those things had really solid technology behind them. Am, am I kind of reading that right? You're There's a couple I'm not real familiar if with. You look, if you kind of look behind the scenes, though, Uber really moved into uh, a space that was always traditional taxi cabs. Yeah. So they kind of rewrote an industry, if you will by the use of digital means. So some of these moved into a traditional space and just kind of rewrote the space by going at it at a very different approach. So, you know, uh, yeah, you can kind of go through each of these and say that one of the things they had going for them was that they really leaned on their digital capabilities. And there's many other companies. These are just some of them that really jumped out that were common companies that people would recognize, but, you know, the list is long uh, of companies that came out stronger out of this crisis. Uh, but you're right. One of the common themes is that they all had a very strong digital basis. Yeah. Yeah. Airbnb kind of comes to mind. Same yeah. thing. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's a brilliant business model where you don't have inventory. You're using somebody else's inventory. That Uber driver's car, that Airbnb uh, uh, owner's house. You know, and really all they did was create technology that uh, put customers together with providers. 
That's right. And you know, I, I work with a lot of different industries and companies in different industries. And for years I used to hear leaders say, well, that doesn't really apply to my industry, does it? I mean, I literally, I heard a few years back, a uh, 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 CEO of a retailer saying, well, you know, do we, we're a brick and mortar company. This, it, it, digital doesn't really impact us. They're, they're seeing a very different perspective today now that Amazon and many others have moved in and they're playing catch up. So, uh, and, and I can kind of go through many, I mean, the banking industry years ago, would you have thought that that was a digital business? And the answer is absolutely it is today. More and more banks are moving to an all digital approach. So uh, you could go through any industry and show that there's companies that are going to reshape that industry through digital transformation. Um, even healthcare right now, out the other side of healthcare out of this crisis, you'll see a very different delivery model for healthcare than what you saw prior to the crisis. It was already in motion. This is just going to speed it up really as to what we're going through today. So yeah. every industry should have a plan, a well thought out plan on their, their strategic plan that, that talks about how they're moving their business in this direction. Yeah. Yeah. Now, not all change is technology related. That's right. right? That's right. Some, some change is culture change, going after a different market, you know, some of those kinds of things. Um, so I, I think uh, I, I saw Matt kind of raised his hand. Um, so Matt, you, uh, you got a question you want to jump in there on? Uh, maybe, maybe you get tired of waiting. <laughs> so, so here's so here's a question that I have. Um, you think about business, uh, and you talked about resistance to change, and you talked about the need to change, right? Well, uh, so human nature is kind of to resist change, uh, but that's not true for everybody. Mm. Uh, one of the things I've seen is some people, their role is day-to-day -day execution. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot about standardization and processes and predictability and, and those kind of things, you know, execution. Um, and so execution is all about doing things the same way consistently well over and over and over again. That's right. Um, where change uh, is about creating a new way. So in your experience, is that different people uh, in, in a company's or in an organization, you know, some people are kind of about process and consistency and execution and others are uh, really have a job to drive change, whether it could be digital or it could be a marketing job. What, what's, what's your experience? It's, it's a great point, Mark. Uh, you're, you're spot on. You know, you, uh, you even see in sales organizations, people recognize that there's, we used to call them, there's farmers and then there's hunters. Yeah. There, there's the, the people that are good at keeping the day-to-day -day going and keeping the current customers happy. And then there's the hunters to go out there and find the new business. And I think that's also appropriate with uh, change is there's people that you need to keep your day-to-day -day going and running smooth but you need those change catalysts in your organization as well. They're looking at, you know, what's beyond today? What's, what's on our horizon that we need to prepare for? And knowing that the market's changing rapidly, who are the people that are thinking about that next step and the step beyond that? And, and how are they preparing you for that? And, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. You can have people on your team that are focused on each of those areas. And then that's also, as a business leader, Often you bring in people that serve as that change catalyst just to help you get through the change, to kind of push you through that, to give you a different perspective outside of what may be uh, in, in, internally within your team. So there's a lot of ways to get there, but I think you're right, Mark. There, there are different mindsets and you probably need both. The, the, the key is you can't have just farmers only or people that are status quo only. You need both. Yeah. Uh, I've got a client uh, company uh, that did something I thought was really brilliant. Uh, you know, when this COVID thing started, they set up a crisis management team, which probably most companies did. Uh, and so that crisis management team was really about, you know, pivoting to people working, you know, remotely, uh, communicating, uh, and just handling, uh, you know, how they had to do things differently, like immediately. Uh, because of the COVID uh, crisis. 
so, but that was pretty standard stuff. I, I, I think a lot of companies did that. This company did it really well. But they did another thing that I thought was pretty brilliant. They set up a different team made of different people that are all about kind of seeking out what are the opportunities uh, because of this COVID crisis. Mm. Uh, it, you know, is it presenting us any opportunities? So that that committee, that working group is absolutely looking at a different uh, set of uh, issues. And I thought that was really brilliant that one team was a crisis management team, meaning how do we handle the day-to-day -day, uh, issues because of this? But the other one was very future focused. I love it. I love it. That's great. Yeah, it seemed pretty brilliant to me. But but it, it got down to it was two different sets of people. Right. Um, and those teams were made up of people who were kind of hardwired to do to, to to work in the groups that they were assigned to. Na kind of naturally hardwired. That's right. Absolutely. And, and the key is, you remember this uh, cartoon I had up. Uh, you just want to look through your organization, decide, you know, what, what's the mindset or which is the profile of the people in the different roles of your organization. Hopefully it doesn't look like this one, but uh, you know, you do want to make sure you have a mix. You want to have a mix of people that are great at keeping the, the current business running smoothly, but you also have those uh, leaders in place that uh, will help you prepare for the future, as you mentioned. So yeah, I just think as, as a business leader, it's your, your job is to, to, to look through the team and decide do you have the right balance. Yeah, yeah. And my experience is that future looking uh, person or leader, uh, at least in my career, has been considered kind of a luxury. Mm. You know, uh, yeah. let's manage the day to day business and we'll keep earning you know, or earning uh, our customers' business back without a lot of investment in, you know, research or, or, you know, new technologies or new opportunities, those kind of things. Um, so there, it's a different mindset that takes some, takes some investment, takes some having the right people to be looking for what's next. That's right. Great yeah. point. Yeah. So any last thoughts, Mark, before we, we sign off? This was a, a really good discussion. Um, change is not, doesn't come easy to us, but it's thrust on us. And we got to figure it out. Yeah. Kevin, what's your thoughts on this? I'll, I'll, that you're unmuted. Uh, what's your thoughts on change and the, the structure of an organization to, to embrace it? Yeah, I, I think this is a great presentation. First of all, um, the the uh, owner of HEB and Amazon, I wonder who's going to win that race. You know, mm. that's real interesting uh, to me. And I never really thought of that, but that's just such so insightful. Um, it really is mind uh, thought provoking, right? Absolutely. Uh, that, really that someone not even in your in your business right now could be taking over in a matter of a year or two, right? Yeah, I don't know how many years ago it was that uh, uh, Walmart became a grocer. And yeah. then Target right. became a grocer. And then I don't know, a couple of years ago, Amazon bought Whole Foods. So they are in the grocery business. Sure. That's uh, true. So, yeah, it, it's not just technology change. It's uh, new competitors come into the space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think that digitization is the key right now in the business we're in and and that's where we're striving to go to. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think you're right. I think you guys hit it on the head too. You need somebody, you need people to, to continue to uh, just run the organization. And it, when you said a luxury for people, in the, well, even now in the present, to be able to go out and search for new technologies and, and, and invest money in new uh, services or, or equipment, is, has always been looked at as a luxury, and that's really not a luxury anymore if you want to have any sort of longevity, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so I, I, I know Kevin and the company that he works for, and and uh, I, I know uh, the guy who runs the company who is a brilliant innovator um, uh, and understands how to bring kind of new processes and technologies to the market. So to me, that that's that's kind of part of the trick is we got to have really talented people who can run the day-to-day -day business and we've got to have really talented people looking to drive change that will uh, make sense for that company and for that company's clients. Right. 
Yeah, Kevin mentioned that back on the HEB example, I actually uh, uh, have a relationship with that organization. And so I'm pretty familiar with uh, some of the things they've done. So, uh, you know, if you look back, one of their challenges is, which is probably similar for a lot of businesses, how do you maintain what's good about your business that you've built for so many years that a lot of your customer doesn't, your, your customer base doesn't want to see it go away. You don't want to lose what's good. But also, how do you add to that in a way that still captures your new customers and the future of your business? So, you know, in, in HEB's case, they weren't going to close all their, their retail stores across the state. That, that was too critical to their business. But they also realized that there is a growing market that wanted their groceries delivered to their home or be able to pick it up curbside, that, that Amazon and others were going to provide that service and they couldn't lose that customer base because of it. So in HEB's case, they went out and bought a company. They, they realized they didn't have several years to figure this out. They knew their competitors were moving too fast. They didn't, they didn't have time to go out and buy, uh, uh, hire a bunch of people, let them get acclimated and get up to speed. They needed to hit the ground running quickly. So they went out and bought a company that was already in that space. And then they invested in that and tried to grow that as an arm of their business to augment the other part of the business. So, you know, they kind of took a different approach to, to how you uh, took on the competitors in this space, but it seems to be working well for them. Now, I think this crisis is probably accelerating that. I think you'll see a lot more people want more home delivery now or curbside pickup than before. Uh, and, and uh, this crisis may not stay in the state it's been for the last couple months, but I think there'll be some people that for the rest of the year or for years to come will only want to have their home, their, their, their home delivery for their groceries. So I think this is accelerating their, 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 their approach. I've got a neighborhood coffee shop in my, in, in my neighborhood. It's a mom and popper, one location, right? Um, and they're doing exactly what you said, Mark. They're, uh, they've got uh, technology where you can just online order your coffee. You can go pick it up because they don't have dine in like they did before. Uh, they've got curbside uh, pickup and they're doing some delivery just at least within the neighborhood. And so it kind of makes you wonder what the new normal is going to look like or is some of that going to continue? Um, so, you know, that's, that's what we have to keep figuring out is what change do we want to keep driving? Some of that is thrust upon us. And, mm -hmm. and I think uh, from what I can see, a lot of companies are being pretty, pretty innovative in terms of dealing with this crisis that was thrust on us. I think the real challenge is when we're not in a crisis that forces us to change is how do we change thoughtfully mm -hmm. and intentionally uh, as a way to just to kind of get, stay ahead of the pack. That's right. You know, sometimes, sometimes I wonder if, you know, when we do it so thoughtfully, you know, that we don't, it takes forever to get something to the market. But when something like this happens, I think everybody's in agreement. Hey, we got to do this right now. Let's just get it out. And, and I wonder if that's the push that maybe, or maybe a lesson that some people will learn is, um, what do they say that, uh, perfection gets in the way right perfection yeah. gets in the way of innovation and, and things like that and i wonder if, i don't know i just I, I just wonder about that if, if, if i, I think it's, I, I think it's a really astute comment because um you know i've been in businesses and so so have you all of rolling things out to the or to the enterprise right and it takes us forever to roll stuff out because we want to wait till it's perfect right um and what we're, what we're confronted with now is we can't wait. Uh, we're talking survival here. So we've got to make some adjustments and we'll just make the ones as best we can that makes the best sense to us and we'll go for it. And, you know, and, and stuff doesn't work, we'll, we'll, we'll ditch it, we'll modify it, we'll tweak it, we'll improve it. Um, but I think that's an interesting uh, perspective that Kevin brings is will it, will it, will it give us more confidence because we survived this thing to push ahead, you know, with, with some change and some innovation rather than kind of wait uh, until it's perfect. 
So uh, 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 one more thing on here on the chat, Mark, I want to throw it to you here. Um, so there, here's, uh, I know that through change, it's important to take time to evaluate practices and explore options. Uh, are leaders hesitant to display curiosity and uncertainty because they're concerned with subordinates perceiving them as less than an expert? Hmm. How does this insecurity affect companies' abilities to affect uh, change? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a great question. And it kind of is related back to what you and Kevin has pointed out is that, you know, there's some leaders that have a tendency to, to play it safe. Yeah. Um, and and want to go with the proven course. It's always, you know, a safer uh, a route to, to go what's proven and stay the course versus to be that leader that steps out there and charts the new course. Uh, but I think as you and Kevin just pointed out, uh, during times uh, like we're seeing, people are willing to take more risk. Uh, yeah. So the question yeah. is, you know, does a, a, a crisis can be that great catalyst to help you take more risk but beyond it going through a crisis, hopefully there's some leadership in your organization that's more naturally geared to take those risks and to not be yeah. so concerned about those uh, yeah. insecurities that, uh, that Matthew's uh, pointed out. You know, uh, here in Houston, where, uh, where I'm at, um, there's a uh, kind of a new rock star uh, college professor and author named Brene Brown. And really one of the things that she's writing about as a leadership strength is vulnerability. Mm. Uh, so that, that's pretty counterintuitive to old school leadership, right? Uh, don't let them see you sweat. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the old school. And really a lot of her writing is, well, if you want to be a great leader, be authentic. You know, people will buy into uh, you know, authenticity. And authenticity is... Sometimes being vulnerable enough to say, I don't know all the answers, but you know what? We got to plow ahead and figure this thing out. So let's figure it out. And so I think we're going to start seeing more of that, uh, Matthew, that, uh, that leaders are forced uh, uh, in conditions like right now to, to try stuff that maybe they wouldn't have before. But I think this, uh, as, as uh, the practice of leadership evolves, uh, we'll start to see people who get it that authenticity is more really a, a great leadership trait than looking good or being afraid to not look bad. Great, great point, Mark. Well, thank you, everybody. It was a great discussion today. I don't, I'm going to respect everybody's uh, time, and so I appreciate your, your 30 minutes this week and uh, look forward to our next discussion.